bit of time. So I'm going to start this morning by introducing our moderator. Rachel Rubenstein is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Arizona. She's the board chair of the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition and the owner and, thera owner and a therapist at the Counseling Consultants, a group of certified mental health professionals dedicated to assisting individuals, both children and adults, couples and families with mental health and wellness support. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We are so excited. This is our first um, of many Lunch and Learns that the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition is going to co-host with a variety of organizations. I want to give a special thank you to the staff at Aurora Behavioral Health System for co-hosting our first event. Um, thank you, Debbie and Kevin Brown, and a special shout out to Jordan Peterson, who is on a much deserved vacation. Um, as well, thank you to the National Guard for your ongoing support. They're very involved with supporting our coalition, and especially for today's important um, information. Uh, just a little bit more about the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition. We have a few of our sponsors and board members on the call today. So just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, uh, Rosewood Center for Eating Disorders, Kid in the Corner, Resilient Health, and Teen Strong Arizona. So thank you for all your work. And basically what we do at the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition is we are an alliance of professionals that come together with resources and we, um, we ally with community leaders in supporting youth and families in the Scottsdale area. Uh, we focus on three areas, mental health, substance use, and eating disorders. You can reach us through either my contact information at the end of this presentation or at scottsdaleyouth.org. Uh, we are so grateful to the National Guard, um, especially the Arizona National Guard Drug Demand Reduction and Outreach, which is um, who is representing us today for this presentation. Um, their mission is about the ability to enhance and support coalitions like ours, and there are many in the community. And um, they partner with local, state, and tribal organizations to deliver strategic prevention, leadership, expertise, and evidence-based practices designed to optimize our state's ability to minimize the demand for drugs and substance use. So thank you so much. And now about our presenter, um, a big thank you to Sergeant Ashley Thompson of the US Army. Ashley Thompson is native to Arizona, one of the rare natives we have here in Arizona. Born and raised in Northern Phoenix in the Glendale area, she is currently a Sergeant in the US Army and has been serving for 13 years as a logistician serving both as regular active duty and now active Arizona Army National Guard on the counter drug task force drug reduction team. And she's been doing that since 2019. Uh, Sergeant Thompson graduated from ASU with a BA in interdisciplinary studies of criminology and social welfare. And she will soon be the wife and mom to six kiddos, six age 12 to three in a blended family. So um, Ashley, uh, before I turn it over to Ashley, just a quick reminder that we are gonna be taking questions. There is a, a question and answer feature on this call. So please put in your questions and we'll try to answer them. Anything that is not answered, we're gonna collect um, those questions and send out a, send out a collective um, document with, with answers to those. So. Ashley, Sergeant Thompson, let's learn about Snapchat and other digital dangers. Thank you. All right, thank you guys for having me today. I am really excited to go over this presentation and teach you guys a little bit about Snapchat and why it has become such an issue for our youth. Um, so if you didn't have a chance, uh, there is a pre-survey to this as the survey does, is being evaluated for its effectiveness um, and making sure that we're getting the point across of, of these dangers. Um, so if you haven't gotten a chance, you can either follow the link, we put it in the chat, or scan the QR code. Um, this is a lengthy presentation, so I am going to talk fast. However, you'll have a chance again to answer, to submit your questions and I'll answer them intermittently. We'll have questions at the end and anything I don't answer, I will send, um, we'll answer them and we'll send them to you guys after the presentation is concluded. 
All right, so most of you in here, I'm assuming, have youth in your life. In the chat, can you guys put in how you have youth in your life? Are you a parent? Are you a teacher? Are you a counselor? Um, do you work in law enforcement and come in contact with youth? I'm, my, I'm looking for how youth are involved in your life. For me, as you heard from uh, Rachel, I'm a mom of six. We are a blended family. Um, I also assist in teaching a Thrive Resiliency Program in schools. So um, tell me how you guys have youth in your life. So I'm seeing a lot of school social worker, child welfare social worker, parent, counselor, grandparent, uh, director of outpatient services at a mental health facility, an aunt, youth parole officer, nieces and nephews, there are a lot of roles we have with our youth. Awesome, yes. Yeah. So this presentation is gar um, garnered towards caregivers and guardians. However, all of us that have youth in our life really should know these dangers and really should understand how this application or this platform works. Um, and you'll find different ways within your own role that you'll be able to implement safety measures. So. Today, how do you guys think kids are obtaining items such as marijuana, alcohol, prescription drugs, and other substances? Where do you think they get them from? And just go ahead and type it in the chat. And Rachel, if you can give me just a couple examples. Home, peers, friends, school, online, medicine cabinets, home, family, um, purse, older peers at school, online, in the neighborhoods, family, friends, the park siblings yeah. um, so i heard you say a couple times rachel online so a lot of um a lot of this is going to pertain to the online factor the difference is is we're not talking about necessarily worldwide web online um, we're talking about applications and the using that through wi-fi access um, a lot of us grew up and a lot of us understand the way of obtaining these substances through acquaintances or knowing somebody that knows how to get these type of items. However, we've now come into a day and age where we don't even need an acquaintance to find what we want to find. We're going to watch a short clip. Welcome to the newest trend in drug use. It's not new to your kids, though. Social media drug deals, drugs being sold online through sites like Facebook and Instagram. Well, new tonight, 24 Hour News 8's Heather Walker in studio control with what parents need to know about this new trend. That's right, Brian, and it's popular because it's convenient, but some warn it's more dangerous than traditional drug buying because the buyer doesn't know who their dealer is. Most kids have a Facebook and Instagram to keep in touch with friends, but those accounts can also get them in touch with a drug dealer. A simple search for hashtag Kush, codeine, or whatever drug they want will bring up thousands and sometimes millions of posts. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, and TikTok, just to name a few, all have the same potential for being dangerous when in the hands of our youth. However, today we are going to talk specifically about Snapchat. Throughout this presentation, we're gonna explore all aspects of Snapchat. We're gonna identify the application's origins, the appeal to our youth, who is currently using Snapchat, how they are using it, the risks associated with using Snapchat. We'll see some perspective from law enforcement agencies regarding their encounters with Snapchat on criminal cases, and we'll hear from family personally impacted. And finally, we're gonna talk about um, what professionals, parents, caretakers can do to protect their youth in the youth in your life. Um, and now as we do jump into the presentation, one disclaimer that I wanna make is if there is anybody under the age of 18 that they excuse themselves because we're not trying to teach children how to do this, we're trying to inform the adults. So what is Snapchat and how do you access it? Snapchat was developed in 2011 by a group of Stanford University students. And since its development, Snapchat has expanded its capabilities and offerings to its users, rolling out multiple updated versions over the last few years. We're gonna discuss a few of those features further on in this presentation. Um, but for right now, um, individuals that get on Snapchat can do so from any device that has internet capabilities. Remember when I said it's not just the World Wide Web anymore, we're talking Wi-Fi, um, downloading applications through iOS or Android on your phones, your tablets, your laptops, um, but it is still also available in the World Wide Web platform. Um, the application is free. 
so it's at no cost it does have a subscription format um, but it is uh, free for anybody to download so why is snapchat so popular like the other applications listed on the previous slides snapchat is a special media is a social media platform designed to connect family and friends however the most appealing piece to the user is the self-destruction feature uh, Snapchat is developed and is marketed as a platform you can use to send messages, photos, and videos with a viewing timer. And once that time limit is reached, the photo deletes automatically. So for photos and video messages, the user can set a timer that once the person who receives it opens the message, it gives them 10 seconds of view time. For regular text messages, the user can choose that the message deletes instantaneously, or it has up to a 24 hours after opening before it deletes. They can also choose that it does not delete. All content posted to an individual story is available for viewing up to 24 hours unless that time limit is changed by the person who creates the story. So this information um, that's posted to the story, they can set it to be viewed by only their friends or to be viewed publicly. Promoting the self-destruction feature has built a false sense of security and anonymity in our youth because again, what better way to send messages to our friends that we don't want our parents to see. So the next few slides, um, I want to prompt you guys, we're going to go over, I want you guys to um, pay special attention to take photos of if you need to screenshot your computer. This is the meat of how Snapchat works. So this is just a, a list of some of the features within the application itself. Again, it is ever evolving. So they're always updating. Um, we're going to scratch the surface of this list. Today, we're going to discuss the most pertinent, which is um, the newest is Snap Audio Video. This feature acts like a FaceTime for iPhones or a Google Duo on a Google platform phone. Uh, users can choose to audio or video call individuals that they have connected with or added to their friends list via Snapchat. So they don't need a phone number for the individual. And I'll explain more how they add people that they don't have phone numbers. Calls are not tracked within the application, but can be seen by a regular phone call in the regular phone call history. It'll show up as Snap Audio, Snap Video. For voice messages, photo, and video sharing, these features operate similar to the application in the caveat that the user can still place the timer. Uh, the options range from one to 10 seconds or no limit. And once the timer is complete, the message, photo, or video closes automatically. The recipient is then given an option to hold to reopen, and that's the verbatim, the terminology, hold to reopen. If that option is given, the person is um, allotted another one to 10 seconds of view time. After the second time it closes, that content is gone and cannot be accessed again. Um, photo and video sharing includes the ability for the user to add such content to their stories, uh, to their story or the snap map, um, both of which have a 24 to 48 hour public viewing time frame of their content. And we'll talk more about the snap map in just a few minutes. But the other appealing fact to our youth is that they've allowed the ability to add snap filters. Um, some of you may have seen this in some goofy pictures posted online and other social media um, platforms, but it's where they can add text, they can add, you know, you see bunny ears or a crown, they can add different graphics to make their um, photos more appealing. Um, they do have a function called Snap Cash. This feature used to be available on the free platform. However, it has moved to the premium or paid version of Snapchat. But essentially what it is, is they've partnered with companies like Venmo and given the ability for people to transfer money directly within the application. Um, Snap Score, this is a feature, this feature is a competitive scoring system that Snapchat users strive to build. It also helps to indicate how active an individual is on the platform. So Snapchat combines a number of snaps sent and received, stories posted, and other unknown factors uh, to determine the score. The score is visible to the public under the user's username. And you guys can see that in the middle photo right here where it says Ashley, the snap score is 4106. Um, individuals who build a large SNAP score do have the potential to be sponsored by the application in their um, Happening Now platforms. Uh, the SNAP map. So this picture of the phone in the top of your screen. This feature allows users to access a worldwide map showing other Snapchat user content that has been made public. And depending on the user's privacy and location settings, individuals have the ability to see the location of those on their friends list by the way of the bit emoji. So those are the little people that you see on the map. Individuals who post to the Snap Map agree that their media will be posted over the location that their phone is currently registering at. So if I'm taking a photo at my house, I'm agreeing that 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 a indicator will be made over my home that I just posted some in, some public content there. 
The creator will also have the option to include a contact me feature and we'll, I'll show you guys what that looks like at the bottom of the media that they post. Um, this allows anybody who views their content to directly message them. So when I was talking about how do they add people they don't know, well, they're going through a public map, scrolling through a feed of public videos and photos. And if somebody has a contact me, they can then add that person to their friends list and have direct communication with them. Um, they don't have to know that person. There's no acquaintance necessary to make that connection. Um, with the snap map also, um, at least with me even, some adults don't realize that when they're looking at this, it's not a GPS map, it's not a weather map. Those blue dots are not weather indicators or weather clouds. Those actually indicate where there is public content posted. And if you were to click on one, you can scroll through and see the public content. So the more individuals who post in a specific area, that'll cause that blue to start turning into a reddish or an orange and then a red indicating that it's hot with content. Sergeant Thompson, could could we we have an interesting question? Yeah. Um, what is a snap score range? And this person wants to know: Is four thousand one hundred and six a good score or not? No. So a score of an avid Snapchat user is going to be in the hundreds of thousands. Um, my score. That's my screenshot of my Snapchat. Um, indicator and my score is what it is um, just off of research. So you can see how fast this builds. Um, this is me sending me mess sending messages to my husband trying to see how all the features operate. Um, people that are on this all the time will have hundreds and thousands of um, in by way of their score. Thank you. All right, so the snap map, this is the piece that I really want you guys to, to pay attention to because this is how they're getting in contact with people. So the snap map was launched in uh, June of 2017. So again, the application came out in 2011 and it wasn't until 2017 that we had an, uh, an area where we can contact anybody in the world. Um, upon opening the Snapchat application, it will open up like a camera. So you can see that on the far left side of your screen. It'll open up like a camera. And if you select the little drop pin or the um, map pin on the bottom, it will open up into what you see. It looks like a world map. Um, mimics Google map when you zoom out. Um, this is worldwide. So I can look at anywhere in the, anywhere in the world uh, that I want, if I know something is happening in Europe, I can look in Europe. If I know something is happening in Vegas, I can look in Vegas. And as you zoom in to an area, you'll start to see um, the blue clouds and you'll start to see the little bit emojis if you have friends in that area. The closer you zoom in, you can see on the far right photo, it'll start to look like a regular GPS map. Um, the blue cloud will still show over the area if there's public content posted in that area. But again, it zooms in pretty accurate. Now, the part that is scary here is if your location settings are not turned off on the application and on your phone settings, then your little bit emoji on that map will zoom in. And if you move, the bit emoji will move. So it will show you at the back of your house. If you move to the front of your house, it is very accurate in its location settings. Um, and again, just to point out the red dots, if I know something is going on in an area, um, and I see that it's got a hot spot. I can zoom in and see public content in that area. Sergeant Thompson, we have another question. Yes. Um, does Snapchat default to allowing location or do you have to give permission to the app to allow other users to see the location? In other words, is the onus on the user to always put the app on ghost mode? Yes. So your phone location, it's, I want to I want to preface this in saying it's not only your application location settings. You have to turn off the location settings before you ever open up your application into Snapchat. So the phone settings have location settings have to be off. And then when you open up the Snap Map, if you don't go in and specifically turn it to ghost mode, it does preset to on or allowing the visibility. Um, now, if your phone location settings are off and then you open up the application and go to use it, it will ask you then if you want to turn on your location settings. Um, but you do have to turn them off specifically within the application. 
So this video is going to do a scroll through Snap Map, showing you guys kind of about how it works. Um, but once you select an area you want to real, you want to view the reel to begin showing the public content. You can skip through the content by sliding to the right. Um, you'll notice at the top left of this, it does show on the photos the city and state and how long ago the content was posted. So I can click anywhere on the map, but I might be on the border of Gilbert and Mesa. I might be, um, it, it, it'll show you the city and state where the content was posted because where you click might not be where it ends up because it pulls in a reel of everything in that general area. Um, again, sliding to the right, will go to the next piece of content. And then sliding down does take you back to the map itself. Sergeant Thompson, can I can I ask a question? I wanted to clarify. The score is created by the number of snaps that are sent and received. Is that correct? Um, snaps sent, received, and then Snapchat has its own algorithm that it adds to it um, that they don't release. Okay. So there's other features. I'm, I'm assuming if you're posting to the public platform, if you're posting to the map, again, those are all assumptions, but for sure it does take into account the amount of communication done on the application. Okay, thank you. So a little bit more about how Snapchat works. I'm sorry, how Snap Map works. To post content to the Snap Map, users take a photo using the Snapchat photo video button. Again, when you open up the application, that's what it looks like on the far left. After the photo, after the photo is taken, you select the yellow send button at the bottom right. Next, it'll open up some selections of places to send your photo or video to. These options include your personal story timeline. So again, people on your friends list, the Snap Map, which is the public platform, or you can select friends that you have made or added to your Snapchat friends list. I have mine blacked out for privacy reasons, but um, I can send it to any of those individuals as well. Upon selecting this button, the content will only be added to the public viewed map if the GPS location settings are on, because again, you're agreeing to post over the location your phone is registering at. If the location settings are off, it won't post publicly. So how do you get a person on Snap Map? When you open or when you open public content from the Snap Map, you see the view creator button at the bottom. You have the ability to then contact that individual who posted that material. Um, this is how our youth are connecting with individuals they otherwise would have never known. Adding a friend on Snapchat does not require you again to have that person person's phone number um, on your regular device. It's not required to have any kind of contacts in common with them. Um, this video is gonna show you a little bit about that. So again, you click the contact button and I can add that individual. I can subscribe to the creator. And again, you guys, none of these individuals and in the content that I'm scrolling through have anything in common. These are random posts that are made on a public platform. So knowing the status indicator, Snapchat has implemented a way for to indicate a user's status within a conversation. Um, emojis are added next to the username when certain milestones are met and the number next to the emoji indicates the number of days that that milestone was met. Um, so for this, for the next couple slides, I want you guys to pay attention to the top one. Uh, the name is Elmina Girl. So essentially, we're looking at as though you're the person using this phone, um, you're talking to um, Elmina Girl. And for 13 days, because again, the number indicates days, consecutive days, for 13 days, you've gotten the fire symbol and the happy face emoji. So using this um, cheat sheet, I like to call it, this is the different milestones and their meanings that are housed within Snapchat. So remember, we, had we were saying that we were talking to Almina girl and we, for 13 days and we had the fire symbol and the happy face. The fire symbol indicates that that individual is on a snap streak or that they have snapped this person every day and that person has snapped them back. So they've sent a message back every day for the number of days, consecutive days that are listed next to it. So for 13 days, I've consistently spoken to Elmina girl. Um, the fire symbol, I'm sorry, the, the smiling face indicates that Snapchat believes that that individual is my best friend. She may not be the person that I talk to all of the time or the most of the time, but she is a person that I've have, I have spoken with a lot. Um, and Snapchat does rate the individuals you speak to by best friend, number one best friend. Um, it is very childlike in the way that they determine or they, they label these because they're appealing to our youth. So um, 
the reason that it's important to understand these is because if you look at your child's phone and they're talking to Elmina girl for 13 days straight, uh, they, uh, Snapchat is indicating that they believe they're a best friend. And then now that you see the, the hourglass symbol pop up, the hourglass indicates that that communication is coming to an end or that streak of uh, the snap streak is coming to an end. So me as a parent would come in and say, hey, you were talking to this person consistently for 13 days and now you've stopped, who are they? What were you guys talking about? Um, who is versus who is not on Snapchat? So Snapchat's age policy is in compliance with the US Children's Online Privacy Protection Act or COPA in that the minimum age to create an account is only 13. Uh, Snapchat does ask for date of birth upon sign up. Uh, if it indicates the users under 13, it won't allow them to create an account. But as we know, that doesn't stop our kids from, you know, changing their date of birth. If you as a parent find out that your underage, your child under the age of 13 has an account, you can report it to Snapchat. However, you have to prove that you are the caregiver parent or somebody in direct relation to that child and prove that they are under the age of 13. They can look it all day long, but without the proof, they will not remove that account. Once the proof is submitted, they do take the account down. Um, and I can say this from, um, personal experience. My stepdaughter is 10 years old and she got a TikTok account and she got reported. We, I tried reporting her because she is 10 and not 13 and TikTok has the same, same standards. Um, and they would not remove her account because she's my stepdaughter and I could not prove direct relation. I was not her direct parent. Um, but in speaking with, you know, my husband and her mom, it was eventually removed. Um, as of January, 2000, and 21 Snapchat was reporting 265 million daily users in the United States, um, having the biggest user base in the world of 108 million users. India ranks behind us with 74.35 or 74.35 million. Uh, the photo sharing platform is projected to reach nearly 400 million global users by 2024. The part that I really want to point out here, though, guys, is that your 15 to 25 year olds are on this application 48% versus your 26 to 35 year old or your common parenting age only being on their 30%. So we don't even have a matching um, user base to be monitoring our kids. So teen application preference. In April of 2020, Market Charts conducted a survey with 5,200 teens, uh, US teens averaging an age of 16 years and two months. This survey concluded that the teens favored Snapchat over Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook as a form of communication. Um, the other applications are looked at as forms of entertainment. So that should show you the, the difference here is they, they specifically look at this as a way to communicate with other people. Uh, U.S. frequency of access by age. So this chart shows 2018 U.S. frequency of use by age. The important piece that I really want to mention is the data indicates a large percentage of individuals ranging from 30 to 65 years old, again, common parenting age, have never even been on the application, whereas nearly 50% of the individuals from 18 to 29 are on it at least once a day. So what are the risks? Snapchat itself is not a risk if it's used properly. However, just like other social medias, it's dangerous due to its unique platform. The first thing the parents should know is that Snapchat does not allow third-party monitoring. So those apps that, use, that you install on your kids' phones uh, to see what they're doing or to monitor their, their usage will not work if Snapchat is open and, or, or Snapchat will not open if those apps are on the phone already. Um, Snapchat does again provide the user's location via the Snap Map. If you don't turn off your location, anyone anywhere can see you on your friends list. Um, the disappearing content. So again, we talked about the idea of the disappearing content providing a false sense of security for our youth. And then the other big one is screenshots. So if screenshots are taken of Snapchat content, the content creator is notified that you did so. Uh, the reason this is important is because if we as caregivers and parents are getting on our youth's phones and we're looking at their Snapchat and we're saying, well, who is this? And we start screenshotting from their phone or screen recording from their phone, it will send the person who created that content a message because it is meant to be a platform with disappearing content. So the application, the company feels if you feel necessary to save the content, then they need to provide the person who made the content notification. Um, in Snapchat terms, it specifically states that photo videos posted to the application belong to Snapchat. 
This means that they can redistribute it at any time if they so choose. Um, providing the ability to buy, sell anything to include illicit drugs. Snapchat users looking to sell drugs can post anonymous public stories advertising their substances. Um, that photo that you see in the middle that says Maryvale, that's actually what spun up this whole presentation when we started talking about ease of access. Um, this was in the Maryvale area back in November, and it was a four, four um, Snapchat long, 410 second, so 40 seconds of a video of just Hispanic music and uh, what I would assume to be M30s, and it says coming soon. We're gonna watch this short clip. Um, the ease of access around the world to the user that Snapchat provides uh, makes the ability to obtain anything they want nearly seamless. And it's hard to catch these individuals. So if you don't know what to look for as a caregiver, we're gonna be behind the ball anyways. This short clip, you'll see a reporter who establishes a Snapchat account with the intent to see just how fast she can get or find illicit substances. Um, the other piece I want you guys to, to pay attention to is how she plans to get them. I've just got a message from someone called Plug Life. He just goes, hi, hey, how are you? Oh, I keep asking them how they are. <laughs> oh God, it's popping off. He wants to post it. And I guess in a way that kind of makes it less intimidating for kids to buy drugs. All I need is an address and a Snapchat account. Okay, I hope we are to proceed immediately. He's a bit aggy. I don't want to order off this guy. I got a message from this guy being like, yo, what's your order? Um, and where are you located? And I said, hey, I'm in London, is that okay? And he goes, yeah, what's your order and what's your address for drop off? That literally took me five minutes and I could already be going to pick up some drugs. So you guys, five minutes. It took her five minutes to establish an account, actively start looking for a substance, and that individual that she's communicating with offering to drive it to her. Um, as you can see, these dealers are fearless. They make it so easy that they'll come to your home, they'll meet at a park. They, they are not afraid to come to the individuals now. Now, understanding how easy it is for our youths to get their hands on this stuff leads me to discuss the current trends being seen around the world involving counterfeit pills. I've just got a message. So counterfeit pills are lookalike pills to real pharmaceuticals. Counterfeit pills are pills that are not provided through a doctor or pharmacy, but rather through the production on the streets by cartels and sold by drug dealers. Producing these pills may uh, give the maker the ability to add anything to the pill like fentanyl and call it by its prescription drug names, such as Oxycontin or Percocet as depicted above. Uh, with that being said, purchasing substances from complete strangers opens new risks to our youth. They often are unaware of the contents of the substances they are, are purchasing. Um, in recent stories, it's been reported that teens who overdose on substances purchased from another Snapchat user thought they were buying items such as Percocet. Uh, through the investigation process, it's proven time and time again that the product they overdosed on contained a deadly dose of fentanyl. Uh, professionals in teen diversion have also reported that more and more often they're seeing teens providing urinalysis tests that are positive for fentanyl. And the teen's response is that they either didn't know what fentanyl was or that they would have never taken a substance like that. So the DEA sees it. The DEA has released multiple articles supporting these trends that in that counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl are circulating in the United States to include our Arizona communities. And those who are ingesting them are not aware of the contents. Um, the first story that you see on your right-hand side, uh, this was in June of this year. Kendall Hawkins, 31 of Goodyear, was arrested, I'm sorry, on the left side, um, where it says 12 people charged following the right side, following investigation of drug trafficking ring. Uh, this was an individual in Goodyear who was arrested with 11 other people. He had on him though, 50,000 fentanyl pills, five firearms and two silencers. Often these uh, weapons that they're seizing from these individuals as well are, are more times than not being used in other crimes. So they're pulling a lot of this from this trade of the of trading off fentanyl. Um, again, you can see the other story from January of this year where the DEA seized 170,000 fentanyl pills here in Phoenix. Um, Arizona law enforcement sees it. Guys, these are just within this month, these first two stories. Um, the first one, 21-year-old Phoenix woman arrested after deputies allegedly, allegedly discovered 50,000 uh, 50, pills laced with fentanyl inside her vehicle during a traffic stop in Gila County. Uh, the other in one, the one in the middle in Cordes Junction, July 7th, I-17 in Cordes Junction, Yavapai County Sheriff's Office said that their canine detected 203 pounds of meth, 
28,000 fentanyl pills and over a million dollars worth of drugs within this van used to transport, used as a car transport service. So a, a service that takes people places. Um, February 20th of uh, this year, you guys may have heard in El Mirage, there was a family that purchased a toy from a thrift store and when they got it home, they took it apart to wash it for their child and discovered 5,000 counterfeit fentanyl pills stuffed inside of this toy. So again, these are everywhere. And if we're not making our children aware and educating our children to not take things that aren't prescribed to them by our parents and by the doctors, uh, we're gonna continue to see overdose fatalities. Um, the Arizona High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, uh, the Arizona HIDA says that it's now devoting 30% of its task force time to Snapchat surveillance. Um, they've seized more than $3 million in cash in the last three years involving these cases alone. So the general risk for teens and substance use, trying illicit drugs increases the chances of overdosing and or forming an addiction, even if it is just one time. The illicit drugs such as fentanyl are proven to have a detrimental long-term effect on a, a young adolescent's brain development, growth, and overall health. Uh, you guys, this is the point to all of this. Our youth are dying and part of the reason is that they have the ability to get anything they want. They have a low perception of risk um, related to substance use as seen in the Arizona Youth Survey. And finally, they don't know what it is that they're actually getting. Some of you may have seen the story at the top uh, from last year. This individual is Ivan Aguirre. His uncle is Paul Aguirre. He's the retired Air Force Colonel who used to command my team with the Arizona Counter Drug Task Force. Um, he worked in drug prevention for many years as far up in um, working with D in DC, but that didn't stop fentanyl from having a devastating effect on his family. So again, this can happen to any of you. It's not biased to anybody. Snapchat drug sales are not only an Arizona problem, they're steadily becoming a massive problem across the United States. As you can see a couple states here listed in Florida, um, Tyler, Texas, LA, Utah, this stuff is everywhere. So who are the drug dealers? The drug dealers are using Snapchat are the same people you and I were educated about and the ones that we were told to avoid. The only difference is, is that they've moved off of streets to the internet, actively seeking individuals to push their drugs. The drug runners are actively seeking buyers, our youth, and they're doing that via Snapchat. So there's no longer a need to know somebody who knows somebody to get the substance they're looking for. It's made it easy for those kids who don't wanna be labeled as the drug users to go find this stuff themselves and nobody ever know about it. Uh, February 7th of this year, only an hour after making her son lunch, the Oprah Winfrey Net Network's Dr. Laura Berman discovered her 16 year old son had overdosed in his bedroom while under the quarantine orders due to COVID-19. Uh, through investigation, the friend of the teen came forward and provided photos that Sammy had sent him showing the menu from the drug dealer. Uh, police explained that this stuff is happening everywhere and it's extremely hard to track down the buyers. Snapchat aids law enforcement by way of deleting the account right away, but not identifying the owner of such account. Waiting on Snapchat to turn over what they have in the accounts can take up to six weeks with a warrant. Uh, due to federal laws, Snapchat is safe from being held liable for anyone's actions when Snapchat is used as a means or vehicle for communication. So if our kids are communicating on this application platform and one of them, God forbid, overdoses and passes away, Snapchat is not held responsible for that. I'm gonna skip over that video just for time purposes, you guys, because I really wanna get to the last piece of this. So what can you do? First and foremost, we need to be easy on ourselves because many parents and caregivers don't understand to what extent social media has on their youth's lives. Um, it's important though that we keep up with the social media trends and you can do this by simply talking to your youth. Create your own Snapchat account, follow groups that your youth are following and be honest with them about what you're doing. This helps them trust you and not feel like you're, they're being spied on. So tell them, hey, I saw this thing on Snapchat. I really wanna get an account, it looks cool and I know you have one and ask them how to use it. Um, Sergeant, so again, talk to Sergeant Tom, I'm sorry, can I, um, we have had a couple questions about fentanyl. Do you mind if I? So um, wanting some clarification on exactly what fentanyl is and what the kids think that they are buying and why fentanyl is per so particularly um, potent and deadly. Yes, so fentanyl is a man-made, uh, it was initially made as a pain reliever um, used in hospitals and it, it is man-made, but it, when it's ta it was taken from at the street level, they started producing it mainly in China and then it get, it was 
route it through Mexico and makes its way here. Um, but it, it's, it's a man-made substance that is highly addictive and it's put into other substances because of its addictive qualities. Um, when youth are overdosing from these items, they're, they could be individuals that have a substance use issue and they might be doing um, any type of substance, honestly, at this point. Um, and the fentanyl is within the substance that they would normally use. Other things that we have seen is kids who have never been drug users, um, but may have taken an Oxycontin because of a dental surgery or a sports injury. And they no longer have that medicine that they received from a doctor, but then they have a new ailment. They can know that they see these things on Snapchat. They can go on Snapchat and search for what they believe to be Oxycontin or Percocet or other pain relievers that they may have taken in the past under doctor supervision and purchase this from an individual on the street and that substance um, because it's it's made by cartels and on the streets, it's pressed and not regulated. So the amount of fentanyl that is in each pill differs per pill, per substance. Um, now, again, it's not always in pill form because we're starting to see sub, um, fentanyl in things like methamphetamine. We're starting to see fentanyl in marijuana. So, and, and I'm not talking about marijuana that's coming from dispensaries. I'm talking about strictly items that are purchased from drug dealers. Um, non-regulated drug use or illicit drug use is where we're starting to see more and more fentanyl showing up and killing our kids who are using things or killing our youth that are using things that otherwise may not have killed them in the past. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so again, it, jump back in. It is important to talk to your youth. So having open, honest conversations with your youth and having them often, it's going to become your most powerful tool. Um, before approaching them, though, you want to ask them, are your kids at risk? Are, do their friends use? Do their friends smoke tobacco? Or do they, your friends vape? Um, do they understand the risks of drug and alcohol use? Or what would make them want to use these substances? It's also important to know their stressors. They can be simple, like homework or a drama at school, but their stressors can also look like adult stressors. They can have the same worries about finances. They can have the worries of parents divorcing, um, overwhelming responsibility for younger siblings. Um, it's important not to discredit their stressors. So when you're talking to your kids, avoid yes, no questions, have more um, open-based conversations. Um, simple, non-threatening questions are easy ways to promote uh, healthy conversation. And if stressors are identified, trying to talk through them with your team, but not solve the problem for them. Chances are they're going to ask you how you would handle it or how you would solve it. And then you'll be able to give them your opinion. But if we jump in right away and try and solve their problem for them, they're going to turn away and not want to ask for that help um, and think that well, you're just trying to fix my issues again. Sergeant Thompson, we had another question about vaping and is yeah. vaping a danger for fentanyl? I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of like, is that a gateway to fentanyl? Um, I don't know necessarily as a gateway, but vaping is being seen, um, you know, our youth are, are vaping marijuana or THC substances and fentanyl is diverse. It's a, able to be smoked. It's able to be ingested. So um, I don't know any of any specific cases of fentanyl being in vapes, but I wouldn't at this point, I wouldn't um, exclude it from the possibility. Thank you. Now, again, we're talking about illicit substances. I'm not talking about the stuff that you can buy in stores. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. So monitoring your youth, monitoring um, all of the, the conversations and talking to your youth doesn't take away the need to absolutely monitor, 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 monitor their social media activity, know who they're talking to online. Are these real people or are they virtual friends and ask them what things mean if you don't understand what it is that you're seeing. Again, guys, get your photos out, start taking some pictures because I'm going to run through this one really quick, but it's really informative. Know the lingo, know how our kids are communicating with each other. Drug dealer related conversations can and likely will include emojis and acronyms. Um, hashtags, hashtags can be plugged into any platform, social media platform search bar. And so essentially you would type in hashtag M30 and it will show me every post posted with the hashtag M30. So if I'm a kid looking for something and I know that it's under a, a catchy hashtag, I'm gonna go search other posts that are made with that hashtag. Um, our youth have also developed their own acronyms. So you and I can assume that DOC stands for Department of Corrections, but for our youth, it's drug of choice. Uh, PI is not private investigator, but parent investigating. 
Um, POS, I'm sure we can all assume what POS means, but to our kids, it's parents over shoulder. That's interchangeable with MOS, mom over shoulder, DOS, dad over shoulder. Um, KD9 uh, is interchangeable for code nine, our parents are watching. Uh, KPC is keeping parents clueless. And PAL is parents are listening. There are thousands of these. I'm sure you guys have seen some, you know, LOL, laugh out loud. Um, WTF, these are all acronyms that our kids have developed is a way to communicate without typing real sentences or real words. So Google what it is you see if you don't know what it means or ask your kids, hey, what does this mean? You put TF, what does that mean? You put AF, what does that mean? Chances are they're not gonna be allowed to tell you what the actual words mean because they're gonna be negative words, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of how our kids are communicating what it is that they're saying. On um, the other, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. We have um, two questions about um, about one is about um, why is this allowed on Snapchat if there's rules to keep drugs off of it, and then the other question is what's the typical way that youth obtain these substances via Snapchat? Is it um, they order it over Snapchat, get it by mail, meet someone on the street? Someone had a question about that. So it depends on the, to answer your first question, Snapchat does have rules, however, they're not enforced. Um, and that's one of the biggest problems that law enforcement is running into is because they're not enforced, um, they, or they're not actively looking for these problems, uh, they, they don't catch them. And the time limit on the content helps that content disappear. Um, however, when the content does show up, they can be reported by anybody. So if you have an account and you're scrolling through Snapchat public content and you see something that is illicit or you see something that you know is illegal, you um, as a normal citizen can report that anonymously to Snapchat and then they will remove it. But they're not, the organization themselves is not actively looking through their content postings and deleting stuff themselves, um, much like TikTok kind of does. Um, and to answer, and the other question, I'm sorry, can you rephrase that other question? Or can you ask me that other question again? <laughs> Rachel, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Is it typically sent by mail when, when kids are getting um, illicit drugs? Are they, are they meeting? Like what's the most common way that kids are connecting with Snapchat drug dealers? So this is really determined on how old the individual is. Um, like I said, these drug dealers have no issue bringing it to home. So if you have a child who's not at a driving age or they're not out with their friends and able to meet people in different places, um, these dealers have no issue driving to a local park or down the street to the mailbox as in the case with Sammy. He went to the mailbox and he met the person that he purchased his items from. He mm -hmm. thought he was getting Oxycontin and it was laced. So it really just depends on they're out to make the dollar. Um, so they'll bring it to you. Um, that we've seen just recently a DEA case where they were mailing drugs from here to Florida. So this stuff is versatile and it's easy to hide in the form of a small pill, uh, but it's, it's lethal. Sergeant Thompson, what is CD9? We're getting lots of questions about that. Um, CD9 is a, it shows up as, par it's, a, it's a code, so to speak. So think of like police codes, um, but our youth are using, you'll either see it as the number nine, it'll say CD9 or it'll say code nine. And that's parents are around. That's the common um, acronym used to indicate that the parents are around. Another one you'll see is 99, which is parents are gone. Someone's bringing up a really good um, point that kids will most likely not be honest when we ask them about the acronyms or what their, yeah. their behavior is on Snapchat and um, to look at the Urban Dictionary as well online for some of the meanings of these acronyms. And, and we've also had a lot of questions about emojis too. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna jump into the emojis quick. So these emojis that you see on the middle of your screen, each line indicates can, can indicate a different type of substance. So the top line can indicate any um, cocaine. So the one with the snowflake, any of those can indicate cocaine if you see them in a conversation. The palm tree, pretty typical, can indicate marijuana. The grapes can indicate um, codeine, syrup, or lean, as it's been called. Um, the blue M&M can indicate pills, MDMA, you know, your M30s, Percocets, um, Xanax, any kind of pill-formed drug. Uh, the diamond, can in, any of that can indicate methamphetamine. The needle, uh, the syringe can indicate heroin. 
and the mushroom can in indicate magic mushrooms or shrooms. The fuel pump on the side, if you see that in a conversation, it can indicate being gassed, drunk, or intoxicated. So I'm gassed, I'm, I'm lit. Um, you'll see that or you'll see a little fire symbol. Uh, the spaceship uh, this can indicate drug potency. So if they feel that they got something that was high potency or, or good stuff, you may see it indicated with a rocket ship. The plug, that can indicate a dealer connection. So they know somebody who knows how to get whatever it is their friend or whoever they're communicating with wants. Um, and the pie can indicate either they are baked, so high, or that the individual has a large quantity of whatever substance the individual is looking for. So I have a large quantity of cocaine. I have a large quantity of methamphetamine. Surgeon Thompson, what do you recommend that uh, parents and adults do, like look for on a child's phone besides looking at the location settings? What else do you recommend that parents do um, look for or alter to help manage this? Look in the specific conversations. Now I know our kids are crafty and I know that they can delete messages and I know I know that they have ways to, of hiding things. But if you see conversations that are talking with emojis or talking with acronyms um, and it's on a regular text message, screenshot that and send it to your phone. If it's on Snapchat, take a picture of, the, of their phone with your phone and so that you can go back later and look those things up. Everything uh, in this world, you guys, you can Google. You can Google what a snowflake means. And you know, you can, does a snowflake indicate drugs? What does PAL mean? Um, and it will give you a list. And then you can take that back to your kids and say, hey, I know that this can, this can mean these things. Can you tell me what it is that you guys are talking about? They might not be honest with you, but it might show that you're interested in what's going on and that you've, you've taken the time to understand how they are communicating. And honestly, they might laugh at you. My daughter has come up with some really weird terms and I'm like, I don't even know what that means. But then I go, I go research what it is she said to me. And then I can come back and say, hey, that's not appropriate. I don't like when you say that. Don't say that in this house. Or it could be something really honestly not dangerous and I just not bother with it. Thank you. Yes. So you guys were wondering what the drug dealing menus look like. When you're scrolling through Snapchat, this is exactly how they come across. Um, they're not going to be specific, but as you see the one in the middle with the emojis, they're, they're selling specific things and using the emojis to indicate what it is they're selling. And our kids know exactly what all of this stuff is. Um, so if you see something that looks like this, if you see something that looks like this, these are all indicated with drug selling and these are all Snapchats directly from, or snaps from Snapchat this is all stuff that has been investigated by Arizona law enforcement. So guys, these were here in Arizona. This was posted in our areas. Um, they don't care about posting their face. They don't care about posting their guns. Some of them will even post a serial number. They're selling guns, they're selling drugs. Anything illicit that you can think of is happening on this application. Some more drug selling, um, they'll show the drugs themselves. They'll show them sitting with the drugs and the money and the guns. Um, as you can see here, the, um, the one with the M1K, that individual, that's his ad to sell this stuff. They'll put a hashtag in how to find this stuff when you search on different platforms. They'll put an at symbol with their screen name to find them on different platforms. So Sergeant Thompson, we only have about five minutes left. Unfortunately, we could, uh, there's so much to learn and so much for you to share with us. Um, we have time for just a, a couple more questions. And I, one parent asked what, if, if there's any support for parents and youth, in particular kids like nine to 15, who don't have access to social media while they're, all their other friends do. And I know you have some amazing resources and I thought that would be great yes. for you to share. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. So we, I do, the, again, guys, this presentation is normally 90 minutes um, and I was trying to talk as fast as I can, but <laughs> um, this is a national service for anybody who um, is already dealing with this issue. Um, these are national. These ones, you guys can take a picture. These are all here within the state. Talk Now Easy is a national awareness campaign that's being run by um, the Substance Abuse Coalition Leaders of Arizona. And you may hear their ads on TV, online. Um, you'll see the billboards here around Arizona. There's also options to find treatment. Um, Arizona has the nation's first opioid hotline that was established in 2018. Individuals can call. Also, we have 
um, provided the resources specifically for youth. They have text options. They have phone call options. These kids can reach out. They can talk to somebody. They can get the help that they need without anybody necessarily knowing or needing to know what's going on. Um, one thing that I do want to say before we um, end is that it's important, number one, that we reduce the stigma on naloxone. Naloxone nasal spray is a life-saving medication that is available um, at no, low to no cost through the pharmacy. Um, our governor, Doug Ducey, in, signed HB 2355 in May of 2016, allowing pharmacists to dispense naloxone without a prescription to anybody who asks um, experience or for any person at risk of experiencing an opioid related overdose or family member or community member in the position to assist a person suffering from an overdose. It's a safe to have in your home as aspirin. Obviously, if your kids get a hold of it and they're not supposed to have it, you follow the um, precautions as you would for any kind of medication that they take, but it only reacts if there's an opioid in the system and it binds the opioid receptor so that that person can get medical help without um, losing, uh, without their respiratory system failing. Um, the other piece that is really important that I really want to drive home is in Arizona, uh, in 2018 in Arizona, we did pass a law, the Good Samaritan law. This law protects a person in the event that they need to receive aid or render aid as a result of a drug related overdose. In Arizona, we have had youth overdose and pass away while with friends because the friends were afraid to call for help thinking that they might get in trouble. The law protects those who administer naloxone as well in good faith, believing somebody is suffering from an overdose from any legal action. Again, this we need to talk to our kids, but we also need to let them know if something happens when you're with your friends, if you think somebody is overdosing, call somebody, you will not get in trouble. Uh, Sergeant Thompson, someone asked how you can get Narcan. So Narcan is, um, if you go to that website, naloxoneaz.com, it will show you some of your community-based organizations around Arizona. They are all direct um, distributors for nal uh, naloxone at, for free. Um, us at the National Guard come out to your drug uh, take back events four times a year and we distribute naloxone for free to everybody, anybody that will take it. Um, you can also get it from any pharmacy they do charge. Um, you can get it from, you can, reach out to fire stations to see if they have some. But again, naloxoneaz.com will show you all areas that you can get it from. Uh, another question, I'm gonna squeeze in as many as we can. If you screenshot a drug menu and the other person is notified, can the drug dealer find the person who did the screenshot or does there cause any kind of problem? Absolutely, and that's why it's such a dangerous situation when you screenshot mm -hmm. anything drug related or crime related on Snapchat because it does send that person a message. And if that person wants to know why you took their picture, they can add you as a friend. And as soon as they add you as a friend and your location settings are not turned off, they can then see where you're at and they can come to where you're at. There have been many, many cases where um, individuals have drive-by shootings happen. Um, people who purchase substances and don't um, pay the correct amount. The individual can find them based off of their Snapchat locations. Um, I pull this one up just so you guys can see where you would go to one report any material that you see. It would show up as a flag at the bottom of the content that you're viewing. Uh, they do have a specific to report it as attempting to buy and sell drugs or weapons. And then also to show you guys in the settings where you would turn off your location settings under ghost mode. Um, you know, they even label it so that some adults don't know or so people don't know necessarily what how to turn off your location setting. That was so uh, eye-opening and disturbing and wonderful. Thank you so much for okay. the information. Um, again, there. just to clarify, there will be a recording available on the Aurora Behavioral Health System website in about 10 days. There are many questions that came in at the end. We will collect those and send out a collective response um, document with those. Yeah. As and well. if everybody could, um, take the post survey, please. Yes, please take the post survey. Um, thank you, Sergeant Thompson. That was excellent. And I'm going to pass it now back to Debbie for any final announcements. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I have so much information. I'm glad that my daughters are 24 and 25, but I plan to send this um, link once it's uploaded to every single person I know that has or will have a child because this is such critical information. And the only time that we can do something about it is when we actually, you know, are monitoring our own kids, what they're doing, what they're watching, 
all of that. Um, so thank you so much, Ashley. That was amazing. Thank you, Rachel, for hosting or for moderating, hosting, whichever, moderating. Um, I would like to remind everybody that the CEU certificates give us about seven days. Those will be emailed to you. And then the recording of this presentation uh, will be up on our Aurora website in about 10 days. Um, Jordan, who does that, he is actually on vacation in the Bahamas, which I wish I was in, but I'm glad I'm here. Um, so he will be able to do that when he gets back again. That'll probably be about 10 days. And I will ask him to shoot an email out to everyone who registered with that link. So don't worry about you know, getting the link now. If you registered for this, I will make sure that that, um, that link gets sent to you when it's on our website. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, again, what a... What an important, important topic and important presentation. Get involved. There are, you know, coalitions in Scottsdale, in Goodyear, in Glendale, in Buckeye. Um, you know, get involved. Do some, do some research, do some help. So thank you again. I am Debbie from Aurora Behavioral Hospitals. Um, my partner in crime, Kevin Brown, is on here as well. Um, if there's ever anything we can do for you, please reach out. And I hope everyone has an awesome and amazing weekend and safe. Bye.